Hi everyone, how are you? Good. Good. Sorry, I'm a little late. There's a, a people from University Twente. They came really late, so I had to like, uh, I had to run, I had to run, and but they keep on asking questions, so I uh, it's a poor time. But anyway, uh, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad that you guys can see this a little uh, more in detail. Uh, uh, how many people seen uh, the news? Came out last week, I think. Okay, not many people saw it. Uh, it was on CNN front page and uh, we're showing like several years of work like once in a while, so I hope we can catch up. This is the second version, um, but I will talk about what is really going on behind this uh, machine and what is really important, what is really happening. So um, as you will know, probably I don't need to even inspect and then have a survey about it. How many hours are you guys spending on this device? a day. How many people say about two hours? How about people say like five hours? How many people say like 10 hours? Holy crap, okay. Um, anyway, so think about what your, we call technology so far, or last decade or so, are focusing on information, right? You guys watch videos, you talk to your friend and check the news, check weather. Wow, you used to have to click five times, now I have to just click once. Oh, now I need to just talk to Sherry without like, oh, right? And, and then, wow, oh, this is amazing new technology, I just need to click one more time. Like, I don't need to click twice, I need to click once. If you think about how much can we get better? <laughs> like, do we all feel like a new world because I click three times and I click once? You see what I'm talking about? Like, you're getting in a pattern of like diminishing return. Why? Because we're dealing with information. Information is very light. Sometimes it's heavy. If you have a watch, HD video is slow, but you're talking about just sending bits through the, uh, your communication path. So uh, in my opinion, pretty quickly, technology associated with the information will slow down in development. It's not because the technology slowed down. It's because what we can do for our, our life is not that much different from now on. We already have uh, all the videos we can watch. We can, we can listen to everything, we can, we can listen. We can send a text anywhere in the world within like half a second nowadays, right? How much do you want faster? Do you want your life to be like even more, twice more faster and crazy than now? Do you think our life quality will get better if you have a twice faster text messages? Your typing skill get twice faster, you get chat with your friend more frequently, even more frequently than now? Do you think it's gonna, so they're diminishing return because we are dealing with the software. If somebody create an amazing app, some company made a crazy amazing app, and then you go to CNN front page, it's really popular. How long is it gonna take to spread out the world? Nowadays it's a matter of like weeks, maybe like month. So there are a lot of people who are gonna jump into this environment uh, in this business and then compete each other. And then you, you see how many apps per day you see, new, new apps. And then once somebody uh, pr uh, launch on the app, app store, anybody in the world can see it. You see that how, how fast uh, the spread out happening? And then that means it's gonna saturate pretty quickly because there's so many people are working together. And you have to take a look where, you have to somewhere else where, oh, this is actually much harder, it's gonna take slower. That's where you have to think about invest your future so that it can, oh, in the future it can be useful. And then it's not easy to take over. That's actually where the physical world is happening. It's not as easy as sending just bits and atoms, uh, just bits and bytes through the internet. You can't quite solve this problem by just writing a program and then just distribute through the app store. Right? Because you have to actually apply physical forces, you have to actually do physical energy exchange. You can't do it. You have to actually uh, do something uh, on it, like physically. A lot of problem, delivery problem. Elderly care, uh, US is okay so far, but if you go Asia and Europe, their elderly population is growing like really, really fast. For, like if you give one data point, uh, Korea, I think in 19, um, 2050, over 55-year-old will be about 43% of the whole population. Think about it. If you see 10 of them and four of them are over 65, 
out of 10. And then other countries are not so much better. It's medical technology get improved, and then they're, um, you know, they're, they, they cure more, more issues. And, but their physical problems are not improving that much. Our knee replacement surgery hasn't been changed that much from three decades ago. Any muscle uh, problem and then mobility problem, this hasn't quite changed a lot. We, have a, we, we improve a lot of other, other issues like cancers and then diabetes and so on, but uh, when it comes to physical work, there are a lot more people will be healthy, yet can't quite move, can't really do anything. And then that population is growing really, really fast. That's actually the biggest thing we have to think about. And uh, some uh, really renowned professor actually think this is something we have to do. If you every phone, have your, your phone can watch Ultra HD without any delay, that would be amazing, right? But is that really something mandatory? Do, do you think that's actually really will change our life? Or something that can actually help the old people who can actually work a little longer, or uh, the people who have a mobility problem, and then we provide some technology, they can actually move around like young people. Think about which one would you spend time on. So um, there are many, many issues, uh, home security, uh, disease response, and so on. There are many, many uh, physical services we have to really uh, focus on in the future, which is not going to be solved uh, easily, like just sending a program through the internet. And a lot of these are actually associated with the mobility. Think about it, you have an amazing machine that can uh, handle like a cups and an opening bottle, but it can't move, it's stuck on the wall. And how is, how is that gonna help the people who have a mobility issue, right? And if it, a lot of physical services, you have to move around. You can't help uh, some old people in the house without moving around, right? I have an amazing robot that's stuck on the wall, <laughs> can help somebody in the house. It doesn't really make sense, right? So a lot of issues here is actually uh, associated with mobility. And let's take a look at mobility technology. We've been, you probably not necessarily uh, pay attention to these, but we've been focusing on developing new mobility a lot well, for the last 100 years, 200 years, maybe more than that. And we had a pretty good airplanes. Uh, we, we don't need to worry too much about airplane crash nowadays. And we can go almost everywhere in the air, right? And we have a, a lot of ship, very safe ship, and we can go probably almost everywhere on the surface. On the water is another issue, but that's not because we can, the machine cannot travel. It's more like a communication and, and visibility, other issue. At, at least the just mobility issue, we, we are okay in the water too. Um, how about ground? How do you feel like ground technology, ground mobility technology? It's fine, right? You can go anywhere, it seems like, right? But if you really think about it, the, our, your bicycle, your car, your train, even, even tank, you can't go without having uh, the, our man-made environment. Our car works because we have road. Our train works because we have rail. Think about just a rocky mountain. What kind of vehicle can go through a man-made machine? Nothing. Only we can go. <laughs> well, not all of us, right? <laughs> Only some of you can go. And then if you look at the animal world, they're like mountain goats and snow leopard. They can go almost anywhere. And then we yet haven't solved the ground, ground mobility problem. And that's where actually this physical service become an issue, right? Maybe drone can help you. <laughs> I, I don't think so, but... Uh, or, I don't, I don't know, underwater vehicle may help you when, you, when you're in only water, right? So if you really help us, I think it makes sense to have a machine that can move around in the land or, 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 or a ground, not flying. Uh, flying can help solve some problems. Um, the reason why we have a, such a big difference between ground mobility, look at the car to the cheetah. Can, doesn't need to be cheetah, like any other animal can move around the, in the land and look at the ship or submarine to the sharks or other fish, or airplane to the bird. There's quite a difference as well, like they're flapping, they're using 600 muscle to fly where airplane use only like handful of muscle, the electric motor. 
Like some marine can like swim with only two, three actuator, except uh, fish need to act, uh, activate many, many more muscles. But the difference here is much, much severe because we are focusing on the technology only works on the, uh, our man-made surface, which is road or highway. So we basically cheated on the uh, ground mobility. We haven't quite solved general mobility problem. Even man-made uh, surface like this, we don't have a machine that can easily go up and down. That's why every building has to have the slope, where you know, elderly, like, uh, the disabled people need to use wheelchair, right? Wheelchair cannot go up like that, right? And then the main, why is so hard? Like why, whereas like air uh, vehicles and the underwater vehicles are hard as well. The reason why the land technologies are so slow and then uh, hard, because there's big difference between first tool and then the ground. Anybody has any idea why ground mobility is so different compared to the other two? The first two are traveling through a fluid. There you go. And the movements are different. There you go. Anybody else? Yes. Uh, friction, like like ground friction, and then drag. But, but then up to there, there's a lot less oxygen. I mean, there's a lot less air density. There's a yeah. There's a bad going through the thin air. Of, of course, sure. So that's actually a little bit more close to uh, the answer I'm looking for. Think about my, what my foot is doing. My leg is pr doing major proportion right now, right? But think about now is in the air, right? Right? It's in the air. It's very easy. I don't need to even think about lift force, drag force, whatever, right? But as soon as I hit the ground, I suddenly I'm dealing with the um, ground. <laughs> Compared to air, that's like nearly infinitely stiff. Whereas flying machines are uh, water. So underwater vehicles, they are dealing with a relatively constant medium. Whereas you guys, or any land animal, has to do with constant switch, switch air to ground, air to ground, air to ground. You think about if your brain is, you know, pay attention to this every single detail, you can't do anything else. You guys can do it because you're not, you're not using your forebrain, your midbrain and spinal cord, the other part of body, Taking care of, you don't even think about oh, what I'm going to eat for lunch, and then your legs are like your 600 muscles are firing to do that. It's way more complex than the other two domain, and that's why we're so behind in this world. I want to give you another uh, aspect, which is actually uh, more relevant to my research. This is machines you can see in the manufacturing environment. They're amazing. They're faster, they're more accurate, they're way more consistent human. They can make our product very cheap. Look at this, like it, it removes its body without even moving its chassis. It can sometimes wire things up. But yet, when it comes to physical interaction, if you look back the, the beginning, these robots rarely touch any object. Only thing we, when they touch, when they go under, or there's some mechanism to hold it very carefully, very slowly. Even releasing, they have to release very slowly. They never collide anything, right? If you, look, if you go any factories, any, any robotics uh, uh, environment like this, the machine never touch anything. So think about how I grasp anything like this. I don't go and then like carefully make a contact. If, imagine you have to do this every single time. Your life is going to be 10 times slower. So when it comes to the task that require touch, this is the same factory. Even plugging in a, a plastic uh, uh, thing, like wiring thing, you have to plug in, snap ring. Human is doing it because the robot cannot do this. Every cell phone you guys have, all the components are made by robot. But assembly of display, assembly of whole system is done by human. Because this is something you cannot do with just position command. Because these robots are actually very, very rigid. Even though you turned off this machine, you can jump and hang, it's not gonna do anything. It's like a, it's like a sculpture. So that kind of machine cannot really do things what we do, like observing energy. There's a lot of impact forces. You don't really feel it. I'm about an 80 kilogram mach uh, machine, biological machine. If I jump like this, each step costs about 
twice of your weight, it's like 160 kilograms, which is like 16,600 uh, 16, uh, Newton, which is huge forces. And then these machines cannot handle that forces quickly. So think about sending a machine. This is a Fukushima Daiichi power plant uh, accident in uh, 2011. And even human had a hard time finding steps. Even probably orientation will be very difficult. Think about sending robot like what we built. None of these robots can handle that kind of environment. And then some people tried it. I will show you some of the videos. These robots look like a superhero, but each components are built out of factory robots. They're super, super rigid. <laughs> it's really hard to explain the things you have to feel, but I hope your eyes can tell you how rigid they are. Some are a little flexible, but most of the robots are just literally <laughs> moving sculpture. <laughs> like, see, the configuration doesn't change, right? Think about any of you, if you were in any situation close, how is it possible? <laughs> How is it possible you push with the arm and you lose balance? <laughs> this is actually an MIT machine, and that's actually not position control. That's actually force control. <laughs> it just happened to be the, uh, one of the clips. But think about it. All these robots are controlling the position. I mean, this configuration. And even though you hit anything, you're just, it's, it's a moving sculpture. And how can you expect these robots to move like human and then do act, uh, actual tasks like a human, right? Think about what animals do compared to that. Are they as accurate? No close, not even close to the machine. Are they that consistent? Not really. But every step costs so much forces, very highly dynamic. They are accurate in other sense, right? I don't know what that is. They're really good at balancing. I know you guys are like, sympathetic about the mountain goat. <laughs> is your, is your, your forebrain? So Snow Leopard uh, actually couldn't catch it. But make, make sure you know that Snow Leopard is an endangered species. Mountain goats are not. <laughs> mountain goats are fine. They're flourishing. Snow Leopard, you should feel sympathetic. Oh, Snow Leopard missed its meal. It's going to suffer from starving for a while. It might extinct. You know, like in, the, in the nature, you can't really apply our, you know, mirror neuron, you know, that just feels something just looking at it. Uh, if you want to go engineer, you want to develop something, um, you can't ignore humans' emotions, but you have to really think outside of that reflexes. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm thinking about like writing about overriding your reflex. But anyway, um, if you look at it as a nature, like, oh, Predator looks like bad, and then you know the prey looks like weak. You feel sympathetic more uh, prey. That's just your program in your brain. If you think about a whole ecosystem, that's actually uh, more sad for the snow leopard. Anyway, going back to the topic, think about how these animals handle that high impact, highly dynamic situation. Imagine throwing the robot you saw in the previous slide in that situation. <laughs> <laughs> It will, just, it will just roll like rock, and then it will break every second, right? So uh, physical work is hard. It's very complex. There's a lot of issues. Uh, if you look at uh, a lot of robots you saw in other universities, or Honda, or German, CMU, they're mostly using conventional manufacturing technology, which is good for manufacturing. It's not going to fly in the mobile robot world. And that's why Boston Dynamics has been focusing on hydraulic machine. Oh, hydraulic is good for impact. And then it can be compliant. They can control that way. It's a long story, but you can do it. Their efficiency is about 10 to 20 times worse than animal. They are, like, it, it consumes way, way more energy than uh, it needs to do. So we actually haven't quite uh, solved this problem. How can you transition from this ground application? Manufacturing, the robots are on the ground, right? 
It doesn't need to move around. It doesn't need to worry about balance. You can apply forces, whatever. If somebody really strong, hold your leg very tight. You can do whatever you want, right? You don't need to worry about balance. But that's how these robots are working. And then they know already all where each parts are. That's how we program it, right? But imagine in the future, elderly care or disaster response or sending robot where we don't want to send, uh, we don't want to send human. Everything is unknown and then very unstructured, very dynamic. You have to, you have to worry about balance. You can't quite apply the same forces like the, the manufacturing robot do. So we have to really think about how to transition this uh, design paradigm of the robot. So that's basically the theme of our, our talk right now talk. I'll just show you a couple of uh, projects of what I do, uh, sort of like under bio-inspired robotics uh, regime. So this is a, I'm not sure, how many people seen this one? Have you seen the sticky bot? Uh, how many people? This is my PhD work, uh, utilizing actually directional adhesive. These adhesive actually sticks only one direction which is very counterintuitive, but actually that's how uh, real Gecko works and how this machine works. So that's why it can stick and then unstick very easily. Sticking is not that hard. Unsticking is much, much harder. Like, like you know, landing is much harder, jumping is not that hard. Um, this is probably like a cockroach inspired robot I built when I was a grad student, very young <laughs> back then. Um, it runs like RC car, it's not an RC car, it's actually a leg machine. It can run uh, like a leg. Uh, it cannot do many other things, but uh, we learn a lot from how you learn from animal, how you learn something you saw in the animal world and then extract the principle and then we actually re-embody in engineering domain. So there are a lot of interesting uh, principles we learn a lot about lear running. So what is really running? This is probably like most strange robot I ever built. Strangest robot I've built. This is a earthworm inspired uh, peristalsis. So this is pr <laughs> pretty much doing the same thing what's going on in your stomach right now is a peristalsis. It moves things, difference between this guy and your stomach. Stomach is moving things inside. This guy is moving itself, which is like earthworms and other soft um, animals. Um, it's not very useful, so after I did this project, this is interesting in bio-inspired aspect, but I don't think I can use that in any real situation. So I jump into, okay, I wanna build a machine. It's a sizable, so it can actually apply forces, it can do something, and it can go anywhere a human can go. So this is Cheetah 1. It's very noisy because this machine is pretty crude. Uh, it's, it has to be whole held by the machine, uh, the other uh, gantry, so it, it can't balance anything. But we learn a lot about uh, what kind of electric motor should I use, and then how to handle high speed, and what is energetics. This one has also uh, consume only uh, the amount of energy to exactly the animal use. Uh, so it's very efficient, but not quite capable. It's running 60 meters per second, but that's all it does inside a treadmill. Um, but again, these machines are very, very different from the one that you saw in the previous slide, the manufacturing machine. These are actually compliant and actually can apply forces very quickly. I'll show you Cheetah 2, which is a lot more capable. It's a lot more interesting, at least. Um, this is retired. This is, this is a hang on the wall in our lab. It can run up to 60 meters per second, which is you know, as fast as me now, <laughs> I'm much slower than when I was young. But it's not limited by the power, it's limited by uh, its control algorithm. We only use 60% of its power. It can run uh, anywhere because it's actually controlling, controlling forces, not position. It turns really slowly, it's not very good. But it can jump and land autonomously. So there's a LIDAR, it's a laser sensor, it, uh, scan. Um, and then, again, jumping is not hard. Landing is hard. This, is, this might be a very interesting philosophical principle, if you think about it. How many people play sports here? Like, uh, wow. How many people playing tennis or baseball, like throwing and rocket related stuff? Probably apply to many other sports, but if I apply just in the throwing, Throwing and, and tennis, there were very similarity. Like throwing actually is mostly coming from the, the lower body. And if you, 
if you talk to the professional player, they actually exercise the back muscle a lot. And they exercise the stretching of the back muscle. Because if you cannot handle that, that kinetic energy of your arm, you won't accelerate. Even though your brain is telling you, throw it hard, but your other part of the brain said, no, <laughs> because I'm going to hurt my joint. <laughs> Seriously, there are mechanisms actually like that. So that's why you have to stretch. I'm, gonna t I'm telling people my body, I'm going to go to that extreme joint space. So don't freak out. And you also exercise, so I, you know, capability of the acceleration get better. If you cannot decelerate, you can accelerate. So a lot of times, you, you won't jump if you cannot land, right? So a lot of times, your body is holding you down in a positive work state, like jumping or accelerating or running fast. If you cannot handle that energy, you won't do it. So a lot of times, the negative work, absorbing energy, is actually much more important than dominating the whole behavior. So think about it. if you're uh, really interested in sports, you have to really think about deceleration muscle. You can Google that. It's a, it's a terminology, not professional terminology, but deceleration muscle. There are a lot of people focusing on that nowadays because your muscle actually is way stronger than what you can feel. We are not using full capability because you're going to hurt yourself in many other ways. For example, your calf muscle, your uh, gastrocnemius is way stronger than uh, your, uh, enough to rip out your Achilles tendon. Very easily, like, like that. But there's an algorithm is holding you down. OK, don't apply that much force because you're going to hurt yourself. There's a bunch of algorithm, uh, you know, prevent from self-destruction. <laughs> it's crazy, but it is. There's a lot of algorithm. A lot of part of your muscles are strong enough to rip out your tendon. But there's, thanks to those algorithm, you're, you're safe. But when you're doing sports, you got to be careful with those algorithms, right? If you just listen to every single the safety algorithm, you can't perform well. So that's why you have to stretch. You have to exercise certain part of muscles. Then you can increase your performance without actually increasing that muscle. So this is a very interesting thing uh, you can learn about. Let's go back to the motor again. Um, so this is a very complex topic. You might uh, be able to learn at some point in your life if you're going really deep into robotics. But uh, basically, manufacturing robot I show you, very, very rigid, very good at position accuracy, but cannot handle any impact. And whereas a cheetah robot with our actuator, our motors, can actually absorb energy and then can apply forces very quickly. A very different paradigm. Navigating in this world is very crazy complex because there are so many different components play. There are electric motors, there are rotor size, how about size of the motor, there are multiple parameters there, and so on. So um, it's very messy to even discuss. But uh, the few interesting thing I can tell you here is um, electric motors are way, way power more powerful than muscle. When I first proposed this idea, oh, we're going to build a cheetah robot, maybe not as fast as cheetah, but run at least like a human-like. And then a lot of bunch of experts in the world send me like review, like you're trying to do something science fiction. Like send me like references, like, oh, look, this, look at this muscle power, blah, blah, blah. It's nearly impossible. It's impossible. And I did my own research. It turns out that their references are completely wrong. Guess what is roughly ratio between power of electric motor to power of muscle? Anybody have any idea? Muscle power density is about 80 watt per kilogram. So if you grab one kilogram of muscle, sustainably, about you can generate 80 watt. If you grab a kilogram of electric motor, you can generate about 100 times of that very easily. I can give you an example everybody knows. This is, uh, what is this? If you go any mall, you probably can see this. It's Tesla Model less bare, bare frame without the outside. <clears throat> this beast is about 5,000 pounds. It's a full SUV size. It's very heavy, heavy, uh, full SUV weight. And it can go 0 to 60 at 4 seconds which is like, like near like top. And, and then they're like really the top end. Uh, the car has go 0 to 60 at 3 seconds. 
two point, more than that, right? Two point, what is the record? 2.7, something like that, right? And in order to handle that kind of power, you need an engine, several hundred pounds, like huge engine. What is the weight of this electric motor? It's 170 pounds. They don't even contribute much on the weight of the, of the car. Their majority of the contribution of the weight is actually battery. Electric motor power it cannot be, uh, be with anything else. How come we don't have an Iron Man suit that can make me jump? Or not even Iron Man, like just a robot. They can jump 10 times fast, higher than a human, run 10 times faster. What's the problem? We have an electric motor 100 times more powerful than our muscle. Hmm? Kind of true. <laughs> kind of true. Uh, battery. battery could be an issue, but battery actually is really powerful too. Oh, bat electric motor move back and forth. You saw the cheetah roller, right? So um, this this nobody answer. So nobody knows this answer. So I, I talked to in my MIT class. The the closest answer you can hear is. Electric motor can generate that kind of power in very high speed. So if you talk to Porsche, and then what is your most powerful uh, motor, and then they will show you like, this motor can generate 22 kilo kilowatt per kilogram. It's ridiculous. 22 kilowatt compared to 80 watt for human muscle. They're running at 25,000 RPM. I can't even imagine how fast it is. So they, their power is only available very, very high speed, very, very little force. Why is the problem? You just put a bunch of gearboxes and then some, some transmission, right? That's where it causes the problem. Our muscle, our muscle, our muscle is really fast, right? You think your muscle is really fast, right? But actually muscle is not that fast. Muscle is, looks fast because you're applying on a very small momentum that muscle, if you look at muscle itself, it's actually not that fast, but very forceful. Very forceful. Your muscles are probably the best high force density actuator in the world. And then that's actually really important. And then if you grab those high power electric motor, apply a bunch of like a transmission to meet those torque, torque force to speed ratio, you're basically messing up other parameter like a flexibility and everything. So we are, we don't have, that, those power is actually almost meaningless. We need something like a force density or something different type of uh, aspect. That's where my research has been going on. So how can you design a mach machine that behave more like a muscle? So this is basically what happens if you run um, those rigid robots, high, high speed power, and then something goes wrong, and become pretty much rigid. It looks fine when it's climbing up, but basically there are, these are all position command, very rigid machine. I'll skip this and then, basically this is something what we need and then you need to be able to apply high forces. So while being flexible and also you can be forceful, that's pretty hard to achieve. It's independent from algorithm, independent from whatever. You have to design, you have to be able to design a machine they can be like this. That's very, very difficult. That's why our Cheetah is uh, such a unique and special. And the great thing about that kind of technology is you can sense without having a sensor. What does that mean? How does it work? Like, uh, basically here, the electric motor uh, can be a sensor. And then this is actually not that different. When the, the reason why I'm standing and then I'm be, I'm be able to walk or I'm running, not because I have a great sensor on my foot, because my muscle can sense force really well. There's a thing called the Golgi tendon organ, which is distributed around the muscle fiber. And then they actually can, oh, they're actually attached in between the tendon and muscle. And they can measure force really well. That sensor will allow you to prevent from ripping out your tendon. It sends the force and then stop applying forces. So that's actually a lot more accurate. Think about you are relying on your sensor on the palm of the bottom of the feet. Think about what happened. I bought a new shoe, I tie your shoelace a little bit tighter today. You have to recalibrate everything for your running and everything. Doesn't make sense, right? 
So we are relying on those sensors, but where major sensor feedback is actually all in your muscle. Those are really accurate and really good one. And then again, you're not even thinking about to do that, right? It's some, somewhere else, it's automatically happening. Uh, maybe I'll show you this. This is, um, we're basically testing how accurate our force control uh, of the cheetah compared to what really happened in the real force. We're comparing uh, the data in the blue and red curve. And then there are about 10%, 15% error, but those are happening in 80 millisecond. 80 millisecond is a fourth of your blinking of an eye. And then why has to be that fast? Well, that's all time you have. When you guys are jogging around on the, on the, on the riverside, your feet, your foot stay on the ground about 150 millisecond. If you run faster, it gets shorter. When cheetah, real cheetah, run on the 60 mile per hour, their feet stay on the ground about 45 millisecond. That's all you have. When it comes to moving with the leg, you don't have much time, and then you should be able to control that force. So the bandwidth is called the bandwidth, how fast we can control things is very important. That's why we have to develop our own electric motors. So this is, these two are our own uh, MIT developed uh, motors, which is about three times a, a po uh, high power, well not power, the torque, compared to the conventional one. Basically, torque and force is a lot more important than power. So we basically made a suit for my poor grad student who used to dunk, and then he got a little older so he can't dunk anymore. So okay, oh, why don't you build a suit so you can dunk again? Uh, that's not the story, but we were interested in, um, he was actually be able to dunk when he was undergrad. Um, and he's 6'1", and he's, he can't dunk anymore. But we improve his jumping capability by adding an ex, extra, uh, exoskeleton suit. It's interesting, the jumping with the suit, he actually jumps later. He jumped uh, two inches higher than before, but this is really encouraging data. It's really hard to exceed a human performance with the technology because it give a bunch of uh, uncomfortable, you saw that like postures, how uncomfortable this posture is compared to without suit, you're a lot more flexible, relaxed, because you have extra weight, you're holding you down, uh, he's a little nervous and so on. So it's really hard to actually over, uh, achieve higher than a uh, normal body, but that's what it ha happened. But what's really striking in this experiment is um, we apply, uh, history record uh, amount of torque on a human, uh, human body. We apply about 270 Newton meter. If you don't know what that means, uh, sports car engine torque is about, like a entry level sports car engine torque is about 300 Newton. So we basically applied sports car engine torque on the human body. We barely improved two inches because we only apply on the hip. If you, you need to coordinate every joint, you have to basically apply forces Perfect forces at 600 muscles is impossible. So this is very hard to do properly uh, uh, in, in applying a human and then wearing something, and it's very, very challenging. So don't worry about uh, Iron Man suit killing people. <laughs> Nobody can wear it. So uh, this is a different topic. This is uh, uh, showing you uh, efficiency. So efficiency is actually can be very tricky when it comes to uh, mobile system like a car. So that's why we don't call efficiency in a car. When you go buy a car in a car dealer, nobody call efficiency. Have you heard any car dealer, oh, this new car has a 90% efficiency? Nobody says that, right? Have anybody heard that? They call mileage, right? It's not a percentage, it's not efficiency, but that's more practical metric. And this is basically mileage in the animal world. But uh, at least it, 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 it counter, uh, it considers weight. So zero is uh, one kilogram, one is a 10 kilogram, two is 100 kilogram, three is a 1,000 kilogram. It's called the log scale. The horse is near 1,000 kilogram. Human is near 100 kilogram, right? Sheep is getting lower, and dog is here. Uh, so when the animal get lighter, your, this number goes up, which means less efficient. So in this metric, heavier animal, 
tend to be more efficient than LIDAR anymore. Just, that's all you need to know. And let's compare, this is a trend. So we're comparing robot with the animal. Why? Because that's the only thing we can compare with. Um, so human is pretty good, 0.3. The lower the better, keep in mind, the lower the better. The Japanese, the best humanoid is still seven times, six times worse than human for some reason. Chira is actually pretty good. Chira is under the line. Anything under that green line is means you're better than animal. Boston that is a big dog or other hydraulics are about 30, 40 times worse than animal because it consumes way too much energy. With the, Our cheetah is actually better than animal at this point uh, while being able to be flexible and powerful enough to run and jump. Um, we didn't do any research. We actually, this is just happened to be. Uh, I will show you uh, some of the footage of the autonomous jumping. This is uh, what animal would do. They're incredible. <laughs> Not every animal are incredible, but some animals are incredible. <laughs> Like this one. Uh oh, I missed such a distance. <laughs> right? It's not just, I guess it's, it is timing, right? You have to be, you have to jump at the right distance so you can get, oh, go overcome. And then you have to coordinate the jumping properly. So there's a two algorithms running. One is adjusting step. You have to jump at the right distance. And one algorithm is uh, handling this jumping behavior. And then, well, I guess the third one is a landing. Landing is actually uh, pretty critical. This is the data from the, the laser sensor. This is a ground, and this is ceiling. Why is it shaking? Because you're, you're seeing from the robot, and the robot is shaking. And then once some obstacle come in, we project how many steps do I need to get there, and then, oh, should I move back, or should I move forward to be in the right distance from the obstacle? And, uh, the class of algorithm called optimization is running to find uh, what kind of forces I need to apply on the ground to jump over the obstacle. It's happening 100 millisecond, 100 millisecond, a tenth of a second. It's a very short amount of time to calculate those things, and then we have to do that because robot is fast. So that's also very different from most other robotics research. They spend seconds and minutes to solve problem. We have to solve problem in a tenth of a second. So I'm not sure if you can notice the robot actually go back a little bit as soon as see the obstacle. Look, at, look carefully. You see that it slowed down a little bit so that you can put the robot in the right location with respect to the obstacle. And this is pretty tough because you see and then I have a two step left. So that's why if you go outside, if you go like in the, in the field, it gets much easier because you can see the obstacle much, much far ahead of time. So treadmill is a lot more difficult, a lot of failure. I think we say 70% uh, success. But if you go outside, things are so much easier, uh, which is more realistic environment. This is a MIT gym. Indoor gym. The, the success rate goes like above 90. It's almost, almost all, all time. You don't even see the deceleration because you you see obstacle from like 10 meters away. Just get dizzy. It's GoPro, as you know what GoPro is. You can feel the leap, right? Let's move on, and because these robots are pretty powerful, so it can do all kinds of stuff. It happens a lot. He's not supposed to approach like that. It's dangerous. But anyway, he did. Just to let you know, it's not intentional. There's a bug in our code. Um, we, it took for a while to find out. <laughs> it took for a while to find out that bug. <laughs> you 
see the holes and the other? So there's a reason why we have a wall there. So making robot, I mean, this is a bug we shouldn't have, but even though that's happened, you should be able to handle that impact. But we're really far from it's reaching best animals. Best part. In the Sham Warri game reserve in South Africa, oh they're making the first line, the start of the spot. This is not a cat, don't get confused. These are, these are big cats. These are 300 pound cats. And that's about third floor, maybe fourth floor. And they work in tandem, strategically, right? And then once go in the air, okay, you can't control. And think about, oh yeah, they're a cat, they can land, but this, this is way more than what you can think. Lag maybe observe about 30% of a shock. Entire body slam on the ground, but they are intact, they're happy now, right? Imagine if I do with the our cheetah. Probably it's a scratch, it's the start from scratch, probably. But the, think about animals, most, most organs are soft. Our even rib cages, half of our rib cages are soft. And then our battery is soft, our actuator is soft, everything is soft. In robotics world, like uh, electric motor is rigid, our, our uh, circuitry, like your bread, the PCB board is rigid. Battery is relatively like, soft, but still rigid. Everything is rigid. So you have to think about uh, how to solve this problem. It's pretty challenging. And you can't really solve many problems by just trying to copy everything because there's so much differences. The animal world and machine world and uh, these worlds are just way too different. Uh, I'll skip this. Uh, our lab, so, so far we talked about compliance and how to observe shocks and uh, mobility, but we have to also work. So we're thinking about using arms as well. So I'll show you, uh, this is sort of like a showing a vision of our lab. What kind of robot we want to build and then Every for what? Every year since 1980, an average of 107 firefighters have died in the line of duty in the United States. Thousands of workers die each year in mining accidents. And nearly a quarter million people are still displaced by the Fukushima nuclear meltdown. Phil Pratt, the program manager for the DARPA Robotics Challenge, has stated that if robots were able to take action within the first 24 hours after the cooling system malfunctioned, the first nuclear reactor could have been stabilized. Here at MIT, our team is trying to fundamentally change how we tackle disaster situations in order to prevent these tragedies. Imagine we could send a robot in a disaster situation instead of risking more lives. Imagine this robot can bring all the capabilities and training of our first responders. This is our vision on how our robotic technology could make our world a better place. In the last two years, we've been working on the Hermes humanoid system. Hermes is unique because it is designed to be highly dynamic. Powerful motors give it the strength to do heavy work. Light limbs allow fast movements. Flexible hands are robust and designed with the dexterity to use human tools. This is a robot we intend to send into dangerous situations. But Hermes is not alone. A remote operator controls the robot using a motion capture suit, which is custom designed to relay the body's movements in real time. It can allow control of the robot from a distance potentially up to one kilometer, while keeping the operator safe from danger. Above all, Hermes protects the life of the human responder. Hermes does what the operator does, harnessing the natural coordination abilities of the human. The operator sees what Hermes sees and feels what Hermes feels. We send the balance sensation of the robot back to the operator using the balance feedback interface. This feedback allows the robot to use the natural human balance reflex capabilities. In a disaster, more than surveying the situation, Hermes can do dynamic physical work. That's too easy, that's way too easy. Hermes will learn to walk and run just like the MIT Cheetah robot. 
Merging the two technologies will allow the next generation of robots to surpass the capabilities of humans. We are working on the newest generation of disaster situation first responders. We are building Hermes to save lives. He did that, he put that fire up. Those are, those are real firemen. And it's kind of like funny, but like this is really, really far future. But you get the, I hope you get the idea of a machine. They can move like a human and eventually work like a human. It's not going to be like a Hermes you saw. Humor is very challenging, but we hope that it's going to be something uh, added on top of this machine. This is the latest machine. This is something you saw in the news last week, and uh, a lot more capable, uh, even stronger. Not as fast, because I don't think we can control the machine that fast. It doesn't have a front or back. It doesn't have a top or bottom. So now we're a lot less like an animal, but it's a lot more practical that way. Similar game to the Chira 2, right? But this one can actually gallop as well, real, real like animal like. But it's very hard to control. Gallop is very, very hard to control. That's free. When it comes to robot control, it's not like a human control. You can command whatever, and then the robot will take care of it. So you can command the directions, and then moving speed uh, arbitrarily. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. It's not me, it's, it's my robot. Um, we have a baby now. Uh, well, I'll show you this one first. That's Jeff Bezos. Uh, so, can I wake up? Open to you. We hook up with the, uh, Alexa. Welcome to MIT Teaching the Control. I can answer questions and perform some tricks. Chira, where are you from? If you react on voice. I was born in the snowy <laughs> plains of MIT. <laughs> Chira, how old are you? I'm only four weeks old. Chira, are you happy? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm very happy to be here. Chira, who is your boss? <laughs> you can ask me questions about my creator or to perform tricks for you. All right, so let's do some tricks. Uh, Chira, wiggle. All right, I'll skip to this. So this is the latest project. We're trying to add arm in the Chira and then control from far. You can actually feel the force of the, the other arm. You see my arm, my hand is actually feeling the force that the, the other arm is actually handling. So without this force feedback, it's going to be very hard to control uh, the arms in far away from you. So that's what we're gonna we're working on right now. 
we're going to add on to the cheetah so we can hopefully in the future this big challenge where a small little help is very critical it takes like maybe 10 seconds but even that moving from bed to the wheelchair so she can move around she's not even paralyzed person it's very very hard think about building a machine to do that so uh, this is one example. Probably we have another solution for this, but it, it shows that like how difficult uh, the, the helping elderly people using machines. So you have to really keep on working on this physical service. Thank you very much. This is the end of the lecture. Maybe a question like uh, yeah, time time. sure okay. yeah. Okay, time for two questions. Can you ride the cheetah? <laughs> <laughs> um, how big a dog we can ride? Uh, it's this pretty similar to dog. So if you ride a ninety pound dog, probably walk probably dog will like uh, right. <laughs> it's very similar. Uh, it's pretty hard. Um, anything else? No. A big problem in terms of that. Yeah. Are you guys or anybody um, um, researching about how to make um, electronics in general less rigid? So, so it's a combination of electronics and the electric motor and transmission and the leg design. It's a whole combination uh, of the design issue, and we are we're the uh, one who's doing it. We're the only one actually doing that. So after Cheetah was released, the Chinese star company. Uh, so when I was first starting this robot, everybody was copying hydraulics because Boston Dynamics showed that hydraulics can do. After we released the Cheetah 2, everybody started copying our robot. Chinese star company and then copying exactly. They told me I copy yours. And <laughs> uh, Boston Dynamics is copying one of the joints, sort of like our system. And there's a, one robot, Cassie, uh, Agility Robotics, they're also copying. And a bunch of them are start copying now. They're all going back to electro electric machines. So one more for one of the girls. Yeah. Very much. Um, what's the arms to extend farther than the body to pull the or the body weight further and cover more distance? Like how cheetahs um, extend their arms farther than their body and their legs. Uh, so like the leg or the. Its arms don't extend farther than its body. It's more like restricted. So like farther away, like this. Yeah. Um, so uh, it's similar to what you. If, if I lunge, I get less comfortable the, because the friction. You have to. You, only force you can apply. If there's a friction, otherwise you start slipping. So within the force range, without slipping. It's like getting harder to control the body. So we're much more comfortable. The legs are right under the, the uh, body. Is that, is that answering question, or? It seems like you're asking a slightly different thing. Like, when, when she does leap for a food or something, they usually lunge farther and put their, like, like they stretch out their arms farther than their body. And they're just asking, like, what's restricting that when they, like, the cheetah runs, the robot cheetah? So that, I think that's actually the answer. Like, if really uncomfortable when uh, legs are away from the body, which is similar to our situation, too, yeah. Before we end, I want to show you the, what the mini little, little guy can do. It's 60% of weight. Two. 60% uh, of size. First try! This is First gonna, try! This guy is going to move no pretty way. quickly. Three, so two, one. You're going to see this guy. Nice. Move around the lab, uh, possibly outside as well. It's much, much safer. It's only 10 kilogram compared to 40 kilograms. So very wow. human friendly, research friendly. Oh, no. <laughs> very, very robust. Anyway, enjoy the rest of the day, rest of the program, and.